Ready to go check some cusk lines? Cool. This is heavy stuff. Yeah. yeah. 16 was horrible, man. I bet it was. 25 all the yeah. way up to 28 was better. Cool. Okay, uh, after many, many attempts at getting some cusp, we've managed to harvest enough cusp to make a chowder. Uh, good buddy Sarge here, we're going to make up a cusp chowder. Um, so, I guess to get right to it, first of all, you need a cusk, or a few cusks. You got that? You need about a half a pound or three quarters of a pound of bacon, onion, a stick of butter, um, canned diced potatoes. Um, I use the canned and a chowder for consistency because I heat this up to 180 degrees for two hours and real potatoes sometimes are a little bit uncooked so I use the canned potatoes for consistency um, and simplicity. Uh, we're going to throw in a can of cream shrimp, uh, some whole milk, and a little bit of half and half. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is get the bacon cooking in the pan. What we do is we uh, throw our bacon in, get that cooked, get some grease in there, uh, cut up the onion, throw the onion in, get that caramelized, and then we'll take it to the next process. But it's real simple, like most of the stuff that I cook, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, a lot of prep work. It's just a quick way to make a chowder. So anyway, Get going. So the first question probably somebody has is why do you why do you, you use bacon and fish chowder, right? Yeah, I've never heard of it. Never heard of it. Never seen it. Yeah. Um, because you can. Bacon makes everything better. But uh, we also this is farm raised, smoked, and you can testify that that is. Oh my. Yeah. It's like you walk. Yeah, in. you can just tell. Look at look like, at the size of the bacon. Yeah, it's yeah. like walking into the smokehouse. It's crazy. It smells yeah. phenomenal. Yeah, and uh, what we do is you cut it into uh, small pieces like that. Um, and again, you can use, depending on the size of the chowder, you can use um, a half a pound. I mean, I've used a pound, but it's a big chowder. But for that much fish, and basically what we're shooting for today, I think a half will do us. And uh, the rest of the stuff we're going to throw in the pan as a treat. <clears throat> Essentially, you just get it. Uh, you get it going in the pan. You break it up. Cook it just like you were cooking bacon. You know. You know what impresses me, and I've said this a lot on on my own channel, obviously over the years, is that I'm looking just behind you, and you have a whole rack of all kinds of fancy knives. Yet you use the fillet <laughs> knife to cut that up. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, it's the. Same thing as my, all my cousins and uncles, you know, my older cousins. Yeah. That I come up under hunting and fishing and all that. That's, that's deer, it, man. Deer hunting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, like, Filet knife. I, I think I've heard you mention this, but um, when I was a kid, a, a couple guys that used to hunt with us um, carried a, a Rapala filet knife. Yeah. Deer hunt. Right. And, you know, I never thought much about it. And honestly, back then, I mean, you know, but yeah, it's just because it works. Um, you know, you can especially cutting up, like I'll cut up the onion with it, I'll cut up uh, everything because it, it works well, it's easy to sharpen, it's, you can finesse with it, you know, yeah. it's easy to, like when you're cutting tomatoes, you're cutting onions, you can cut them thin, All right. uh, and like when you're out, you know, gotten a deer, I mean, that you couldn't find a better, you know, other than, you know, you got to be careful you don't poach it, obviously, but they work for everything. Yeah. I love them. That's cool. You just took me back like 25, 30 years. Yeah. Good, good. <laughs> That's what we're all about, tradition and heritage. How about one more strip of bacon in there? Okay. Now, we're going to spoil ourselves. Well, the chowder's cooking. We're going to have a little bit of bacon on the side. But, I mean, that's just like, I feel like I'm walking into a smokehouse at a farm. Yeah, that's, yeah. Like, that's awesome. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> I'll get you some. We're due to make another trip. And once you get your uh, your bacon cooked, you know, crispy, uh, 
actually there's quite a bit of uh, you know so it's crisp and it's done you don't have to overcook it uh, but uh, right on top of the baking grease goes the onions and the reason I say don't overcook the bacon because we get to caramelize these onions so yeah. by the time the onions are actually caramelized uh, the bacon will be about where you want it you mix that right in there with the bacon and the grease Those onions caramelized, those look good. We're ready to put in some more, more of our stuff. Um, also too, we dump out the uh, dump out the water from our canned potatoes. So I don't put any water in period. Um, it's all like I said. Just ingredients. Put in a can of cream of shrimp. Mm -hmm. That's a secret weapon. Right. And put in about a half a pint of uh, cream. is I get all my ingredients in before I put in the milk because then I know how much milk I have or uh, you know, broth, juice, whatever you call it, versus product and versus fish. So we'll put our fish in now right off the get-go. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people put their fish in at the end. And by doing it this way, as soon as we're done cooking this, it's going to be ready to eat. It's going to taste like fish chowder. If you throw the fish in at the end and just cook the fish, this has to sit in the fridge for two days before it tastes like anything. Oh. It has to ferment. And have people do it all the time. Yeah. By doing it this way, this is going to taste like fish chowder right up, right out of the gate. Nice. You know? When we put our milk in. Good tip. Yeah. Um, again, I'm no envelope, but we put our milk in. And basically what we want to do is how, how thick do you want your chowder? You know? Because if you put in too much milk, you know, it's like you can't take it back out. All right. So. And that's personal preference. And what we do is we let that sit. Now, all the time, you notice I got my little thermometer here. Now, we're going to bring this up to 180 degrees. Okay. We still got to put some spices in and stuff. Right, let's get that heating up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Almost need a knife and a fork. Yeah, that's a piece of meat. That's a piece of meat. Wow. Mm. Okay, we're slowly, slowly heating this up. Um, now's the time to throw in a stick of butter. Put that right in there. Get that melting down. And I didn't really uh, emphasize on the spices, but celery seed is one of my favorites. Um, I love celery seed. And, uh, obviously, you can muddle this. Whatever you, you can smell it. Just like. So much better than, you know, just buying the powder and stuff. This is the real deal. It's the only way to get the real taste of it. I don't go sparingly with the celery seed. So love it. And, uh, uh, fresh uh, oregano. Didn't have any fresh, so we'll have to do this. Plenty of oregano. As always, the fresh ground peppercorn. pepper and sea salt. Don't have to overdo it with the salt. And Old Bay. Um, notice how I measure all this stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's precise. It's what you know, you, everybody's got a different palate. 
And uh, one thing I didn't mention in the lineup was hot sauce. Um, my favorite hot sauce is Crystal. It's about 69 cents a bottle at Walmart. But when I was traveling down south, um, a lot of uh, well, the cooks down there, this is what they actually use, is the Crystal brand, and, and I love it. And uh, put some of that in, but the other brands are, uh, you know, the old Frank's Red Hot. And another one of uh, my personal favorites is Smack My Ass and Call Me Sally. <laughs> Have you ever tried that? No, I haven't. It's phenomenal. Hard to find, but it's good. Uh, that's funny. And it has a habanero. Habanero, yeah. Habanero. It's good stuff. Yep. But we're going to go easy. Uh, so we get... Again, this is uh, slowly coming up to 180 degrees. So we're just going to let stuff kind of congeal. And uh, okay, once we get it to 190 degrees, I think I said 180 earlier, but 190. The point is, you, you don't need to. I'm pretty anal about temperature, but you don't. Just once it starts to bubble and you're almost to the point of boil, stop so you don't boil it. Um, I like it around one, between 180 and 190, and then I cover it, put it on a real low, low, the lowest simmer you can possibly have, and let it sit for two hours, and then shut it off, let it sit for an hour, it's ready to go. There it is. The infamous Cusk Chowder. A couple of big hunks on the top there. It's mm. pretty good. Good me, man. All right, we ready to try this beef. It smells yummy. Smells good. Not that you're not professional enough with that. That's good. Mm. Then you just got a big chunk of cusk. Still a little hot. Yeah. But good shit for a buddy of mine said uh called it poor man's lobster. Yeah. Not that it tastes like lobster, but it's definitely its own taste. Because it doesn't taste like fish really that I've eaten. You know? No. No, it's good. It's, it's definitely unique. Used to set a little bit, but uh, 